somebody give God glory in this room today? Come on, anybody got a reason to praise the Lord? Anybody been blessed by God? Anybody been healed by God? Anybody seen God make ways for you? You ought to give Him glory in this place today. He is worthy. Hallelujah, Lord. Father, it is that we give you glory and praise in this place. Father, it is that we have come to worship your name. Father, it is that we pause to tell you thank you. We pause to give you glory. We pause to say hallelujah to your name. We pause because you are worthy of all praise. Father, it wasn't just our our smarts or our looks or our relationships or our education or somebody else that got us to where we may be today. Father, it was you working behind the scenes. It, it was you answering prayers. It, it was you answering mothers and grandmothers' prayers. It, it was you that was guiding us and directing us. And for that, we say thank you, Lord. For that, we honor your name because you have been so faithful in every way. Forgive us, Lord, for taking you for granted. Forgive us, Lord, for just supposing you were going to wake us up this morning. Forgive us, Lord, for all the blessings you give to us day in and day out. So, Lord, we show up this morning saying thank you. We show up this morning praising your name. We show up this morning with grateful hands and with grateful hearts, giving you glory for all that you are, for all that you've done, and for all that you're going to do. You are worthy, and we praise your name. Even if we got to praise you by ourselves, we'll still praise you. Even if nobody else gets it, we'll still praise you. Even when we're weary, we'll still praise you. Even when it doesn't make sense, we'll still praise you. You are worthy, worthy, worthy. We honor your name in this place. Thank you, God, for the privilege of worship. And now, Lord, as we open your word, may your word speak to our hearts and our minds and remind us of all you called us to be. We love you and we thank you. It's in the matchless name of your son, Jesus, that we say this prayer and all God's people said, amen. Come on and bless God together in this place. Amen, amen. Before we look at our passage, you just tell your neighbor, I'm so glad you came today. Find somebody else so they don't get jealous. Tell them, I'm so glad you came today. Amen, amen. And then if you have your Bibles, would you open with me the book of Genesis chapter 3? Concord, we are so thankful for you being with us on this morning. To our faithful members and to our uh, guests and visitors, both in person and online, we are incredibly grateful for you being with us. And we just believe there's no better way to start the week than to start the weekend worship. We believe that worshiping sets the tone and direction of your week. You've been carrying stuff all week long, but when you get to worship, you get to release all that to the Lord. And you get a reminder that you can't control everything, but you got a God that's with you that guides you through every season of your life. So we are so thankful for you. Uh, we've been in a series through the book of Genesis. We've been walking through. We did, we've done chapters 1, 2, and today we're going to cover 3. And then we'll begin to pick it up a little bit. There are 50 chapters in Genesis. And we'll start looking at different characters on next week. But today, let's dive in to Genesis chapter 3. I want to read it for us in, our, in its entirety. It reads this way. Now, the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say that we must not eat fruit from the tree that's in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it or you will die. You will not certainly die, the serpent said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be open, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. And when the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for the fruit, food and pleasing to the eye, and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some of it and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate it. 
Then the eyes of both them and them were open, and they realized they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man, where are you? He answered, I heard you in the garden. I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. And he said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? The man said, the woman you put here with me, she gave me some fruit from the tree, and I ate it. Then the Lord God said to the woman, what is this you have done? And the woman said, the serpent deceived me, and I ate. So the Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and all wild animals. You will crawl on your belly, and you will eat dust all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head and you will strike his heel. To the woman he said, I will make your pains in childbearing very severe. With painful labor will you give birth to children. Your desire will be for your husband and he will rule over you. To Adam he said, because you have listened to your wife and ate fruit from the tree about which I commanded you, you must not eat from it. Cursed is the ground because of you. Through painful toil, you will eat fruit from it all the days of your life. It will produce thorns and thistles for you, and you will eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your brow will you eat your food until you return to ground, since from it you were taken. For dust you are, and to dust you will return. Adam named his wife Eve because he would become, she would become the mother of, the, of, of, of all living. The Lord God made garments of skin for Adam and his wife and clothed them. The Lord God said, the man has now become like one of us, knowing good and evil. He must not be allowed to reach out his hand and take also from the tree of life and eat and live forever. So the Lord God banished him from the garden of Eden to work the ground from which he had been taken. And after he drove the man out, he placed on the east side of the garden of Eden cherubim and a flaming sword flashing back and forth to guard the way to the tree of life. Amen. You may be seated. For a few moments today, if we consider this passage, I want to use this for a title today, Trouble in Paradise. Trouble in Paradise. Doesn't take long to realize that we live in a broken, fallen world. You can watch the news on any occasion, just this week alone, and you would hear about a story in New York where a baby dies from a fentanyl overdose that they were storing drugs at the daycare center. Or you would see the tragedy of a school, of a bus, uh, a, a band that was on their way somewhere and their bus tragically crashed, causing the death of two individuals. We don't have to look far, but all around us are signs that we live in this broken, fallen world. Many of us, either ourselves or someone that we love, is dealing with some disease or sickness or cancer. Someone else is dealing with the pain of a broken relationship or strained relationship. Someone has a loved one that is currently incarcerated or someone in the room knows what it's like to go through miscarriages or infertility or domestic violence and racism and discrimination. We live in this broken, fallen world. And every day we come face to face with the evils and the difficulties and the trouble that's around us. And yet at the same time, this chapter, Genesis chapter 3, helps us to understand how we got here in the first place. Genesis chapter 3 helps us to understand what is sin, why we sin, and why we even die. Because all the brokenness and the chaos and the trouble and the disease and the issues that we see of today are a consequence of sin, and it all started in Genesis chapter 3. In Genesis chapter 1, God is, takes disorder and begins to bring order. Genesis chapter 2, God begins to establish humanity really for three purposes. He created them. One, so that they could have a relationship with God. Two, so they could have purposeful work. And three, so that they could experience community. And yet what we discover as we move from Genesis 2 to Genesis 3 is that we begin to discover that although God has created us for all of this, 
When we live in a broken and fallen world, we are faced with so many challenges, and yet God also gives us hope of how to break through sin to get to where God wants us to be. Here's the first thing we see in the text. First of all, there is this conception of sin. Sin starts right there, verses 1 through 6, and it begins in this sixth. He introduces us to this tempter. This tempter by the name of Satan, Satan shows up right there, a serpent in verse 3. Satan shows up in the form of a serpent. The text says the serpent is more cunning than anything God has ever created, which means he is able to seduce and, and be able to be clever about communicating. On top of that, this serpent also is speaking. He's, he's talking to Eve and Adam as they are now in the garden. They now are in paradise as Genesis 2 it tells us, it, it, they, but this tempter shows up. And the tempter shows up with really one motive, to really tempt Adam and Eve to do evil and rebel against God. Isaiah and Ezekiel tell us this tempter had already rebelled against God himself. And now he comes to try to make them rebel against God as well. This tempter, he, he, he starts talking to them about something. He says, did God really say? You, ha you have to ask the question, in Genesis 2, they are in a place of paradise. When we leave them in Genesis 2, 25, they are naked and unashamed. But then in Genesis chapter 3, verse 1, the tempter shows up. You got to ask yourself the question, how much time expired between chapter 2 and chapter 3? If they are created on day six, how much, and he rests on day seven, when does the tempter show up? Some of you in this room understand often he doesn't take long to show up. It's after you get the promotion that he shows up. It's when you get paid that your car breaks down. It's after you get married that chaos starts showing up. It's after you are in a good place that things start to fall apart because often the tempter doesn't take long to show up and to cause brokenness and anxiety and trouble and difficulty. And he shows up. In my sanctified imagination, I don't think he took long at all to show up. I think he pronounced them husband and wife and the very next day he showed up saying, hey Eve, what you doing? Can I remind you, my friends, that the enemy loves to show up after you have victory over something. You don't believe me? Read Matthew chapter 4. It's after Jesus is baptized, after, the, after Jesus is celebrated, that the very next moment he is led to be tempted by the devil. You need to be careful, friend. When God blesses you, you learn to celebrate it. But when trouble stows up, don't you act shocked that trouble showed up on the very next day. You need to know he's waiting to try to take us out and make us move from where God has us. The tempter shows up and he starts talking. He says, did God really say? He, he, he is now beginning to try to get Eve and Adam, Adam and Eve, to begin to try to critique God. God's Word in chapter 1 causes light to show up, causes land to show up, divides the days. God's Word calls animals to show up, calls birds to show up. His word spoke and things happened. Chapter 2, his word speaks and he breathes breath into mankind. And all of a sudden in chapter 3, the tempter shows up and wants to question the very world that has created the world they live in. This is what he does. He shows up and says, did, did God really say that? He does the same thing to you and me. Did God really say you got to forgive them? Did God really say love your enemies and bless those that curse you? Did God really say this is how marriage ought to be done? Did God really say what he said about sexuality? Did God really say what he said about how you ought to deal with your anger? Did God really say that he will never leave you nor forsake you? Did God really say that greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world? Did God really say that? Or, 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 or should you be wrestling and questioning God's word? The enemy wants you to question who God is and what God can do and how God has done it. And he moves further, he starts talking to her, and he says, and then she responds, and no, he didn't really say that, 
But even in her response, she, she leaves some stuff out, she adds some stuff, and then she minimizes, well, we might die, we maybe, maybe we will or will not. She, she's struggling herself. And then he comes back and says, you're not going to die. Because God, God knows he, he don't want you to, to have this because he don't want you to, he, he, he knows, he, he don't want you to be like God. God holding you back. God's blocking you from being great. God's, God's blocking you from enjoying all that. He, he don't want you like him, so he's, he's trying to put a barrier. God is holding out on you, and that's why these rules are in place. He questions, he causes her to try to question God's love and God's ways and God's providence. All she knows about God is that God has provided for her, God has blessed her, God has put her in a garden where everything is perfect in paradise. God has said, you can have all of this, but it's one tree that I don't want you to touch, not to hurt you, but because I don't want it to harm you. And the enemy comes and says, why don't you focus on the one thing that he has told you no and not enjoy all the other things God has already given you. And the enemy works the same way in your life and mine. The enemy loves to try to make you feel not good enough, make you feel insecure, make you feel too old, make you feel too young, make you feel not smart enough, make you feel like you got too much in your past, make you feel like you'll never get through your season, make you feel like God will never answer your prayers, make you feel like he'll do it for her, but he ain't going to do it for you, and make you feel like you ain't enough, like you don't have enough, instead of reminding yourself that the same God that has sustained you for your your 35 years, your 45 years, your 65 years, it's the same God that will get you through this one situation. Hear me, friend, don't let the enemy awaken in you insecurity and, and, un, 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 and inadequacy because if you're not careful, when the enemy awakens in you that God is holding out on you, that you deserve more, that you need more, that he ain't done enough, it will, it will bring sin out of you in a matter of time. He, he's, he's trying to stir up in her. He talks to her. He, he tempts her. And the text tells us after he begins to talk to her, after she begins to have conversations with him, it's not long before verse 6, 7, she quickly goes down the path. Do y'all remember, in, 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 do you remember chapter 1 and chapter 2 when God created mankind and he said, I want you to have dominion over everything that's created? Because I want to remind you that, that the creature that's trying to talk to her, she's supposed to have dominion over it. God has already given her dominion over it. He's already established an order. It's God the creator. Then it is his humanity, and then it's all of the creation. So she shouldn't have been talking to him in the first. She shouldn't have been even entertaining the conversation because she already knew what God had already said. Friends, you and I got to be careful of having some conversations because some conversations have already been settled. Some conversations, some issues, some situations, some things God has already said. So ain't no use of me trying to entertain, prove to you, justify to you, because all I'm going to do is make myself upset and, and make me question where I am. God has already said some stuff, and all I got to do is stand on what God has already said. You don't like it, that's your problem, but I'm going to stick with what God has has already said. And she starts having this conversation, and before long, she looks at it. And when she looks at it, the text says it's pleasing to the eye. It, she wants to gain wisdom, and she, she takes some of the fruit, and she eats some of the fruit, and then she gives some to Adam, and they both eat some of the fruit. It happens so fast. It's happened so fast. Isn't that how sin happens in your life and mine? I mean, it happens so fast. And we, we were just thinking, well, maybe, maybe, and we move just like that. It happened so fast that we said it, and we, we didn't intend to, but, but, but we were so tempted so quickly, and, and just like that it happened. 
Just like that, we went off in a situation where we should have killed our peace. Just like that, we gave in to somebody, that, 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 that we let somebody take us someplace we probably shouldn't have went. Just like that, we stole the money. Just like that, we, we said yes. Just like that, we lied at work. Just like that, we stepped out on our relationship. Just like that, just like that, we said, you know what, we're not going to forgive them. We're going to hold this girl. Just like that, and before long, the action, just like that, it happened so fast. And then it happens. She and Adam disobey and rebel against God. And immediately the effects begin to happen. The consequences of sin begin to show up immediately. And they move from being naked and unashamed to now being full of shame. They make fig leaves and cover themselves. They move from talking and communicating freely and openly to now lying on each other and blaming each other. They move from being intimate in the, in the intimate with God and talking to God all the time and being in God's presence and showing up in God's presence to hiding from God. They move from this oneness that God had given them to their backs against each other. They, 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 they move from this place that God had called them. God had called them to a relationship with God, to this purposeful work, and to this relationship with the community. And all that has been shattered in just one decision to disobey, to sin, and rebel against God. You see it all right there. And so then God in his loving nature comes to check on them. He's checking for them, and somebody says, well, I want you to understand that God is sovereign, so God already knew what had happened. But God, like a good parent, always wants to give their son or their daughter a chance to come clean. Did you do your homework? You already know the teacher already called. You already got the email that they didn't do anything happen at school today that you want to tell me about. This, this, is, this is God. He, he, he shows up already knowing what's transpired, and, he, and he, he, he checks in and says, listen, listen. He says, where are you, Adam? Where, where, where are you? And, 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 as, and as Adam, is, and, and he asks where they are, and they say, listen, we, we hid. Adam, Adam comes with a bunch of excuses. This is what sin looks like. Sin always tries to rationalize itself. Sin always tries to find a reason for why I did it or a reason to try to explain itself. She says, well, 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 I, I'm here. Who, who told you? Well, well, we, we ate. I mean, he, he is struggling and stammering because sin makes you want to hide. And then he says, what happened? He says, well, God, you know, I was all, we were good. But that woman, you know, the woman, the one bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh, the one I was praising you for in chapter 2, now I'm blaming her in chapter 3, although I was with her the whole time. This is what sin does. Sin makes you and I hide from God rather than rushing to his presence to confess to God. Sin disrupts relationships. Sin is why you're not talking to a family member right now. Sin is sin. It's sin that makes us react the way we want to react. Sin makes it all about us. Sin makes us say we know better than God. Pride and greed. All of these things and coveting and, 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 and this, this issue of entitlement all causes us to take on this posture that we deserve, we need, we got to have it. As a consequence, they get it. And then God begins to call out the consequences right there. He says, serpent, look at your Bible. He says, serpent, he says, serpent, here is your punishment. Cursed are you. You, you go crawl on your belly, serpent. You, you, you go eat the dust all the days of your life. You, you, this, this is your posture. This is your place. He's a serpent. Um, you, you, he, he, 
he says, you, 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 there will be enmity, verse 15, between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. That word enmity means there's going to be conflict and war from this day forward for all of the offspring or the seed of the serpent and the offspring and the seed of the woman. He's saying that there are going to be seeds and serpent, seeds of the serpent, which means evil will have a role and, and people that follow God will have a role. He says, ever since then, there's been conflict between good and evil because God says this now, this enemy will continue to cause chaos and trouble, but there will be two. There will be a seed, he says, from, from, from this serpent and a seed from the woman. That's why we have the chaos in our world. That's why we have the trouble in our world, that the same serpent, the same person of Satan is still causing problems even to this day. Then he says in verse 16 to the woman, you're going to have pain and suffering. Your childbearing will be more painful. Your childbearing will be painful when you give birth. That your seed, when you bring forth children, now this is where epidurals had to be invented because there's now pain that shows up in the text. Then he says, your desire will be for your husband and he will rule over you. He says there's going to be constant conflict in your relationship. You're going to want to do things, and he's going to want to do things. He's going to think he needs to dominate you, to lead you, and you're going to think you need to control him. And this will be the constant tension. The battle of the sexes is sourced right here. Then he says to Adam in verse 13, Adam, because you listened to your wife and ate fruit from the tree, which I commanded you, you must not eat, cursed is the ground. Adam's sin was really the sin of passivity, which means Adam is there the whole time, but Adam doesn't make a move. And every man knows this struggle of being passive because it's been passed down from Adam. It, it makes us want to sit still and not make a move. It, it, it makes us wait on her and, and watch her do it, and we sit and watch it. It makes her, it makes us make demands but not get involved. It, it makes us say, well, I'll, I'll date you and I'll live with you, but I won't marry you. I don't want to commit just yet. It makes us keep waiting and waiting. How long? Because passivity keeps you in a, in a standstill position when God has called you as a man to lead, to initiate, to make a move, to serve her, to provide for your family, to be who God has called you to be. We know you got issues in the past, but God has made you a new creature in Christ. You can't live on that. You got to be new for the man God has called you to be. This is what a man ought to be. He said, I need you to move, Adam. This is what he's saying. This is, this is Adam. This is Adam since you won't move. And Adam, since you, you want to stand still and, and, and not do what I called you to do, Adam, the ground will be cursed. That work that I told you about in chapter 2, that purposeful work where you were to keep until the garden, now it's going to be harder. Now it's going to be frustrating. Now you're going to have sweat and there's going to be thorns and thistles. And now humanity, the scriptures tell us, they groan, and that's why we have natural disasters and all these things. They are all the consequence of the brokenness of sin that we face. This is, this is, the, this is the world. This is the consequence of the brokenness in the world in which we face. That pleasure has turned to pain, and abundance has turned to scarcity, and harmony has turned to conflict, and intimacy has turned to alienation. This is the brokenness that he says that there's whenever there's sin, there's always pain and suffering. There's always consequences. So we move from the conception of sin to the consequences of sin to finally the cure for sin. And when you read redemptive history, there are really four pictures of history. There is creation, which we saw in chapters 1 and 2. There is fall that happens in chapter 3. But then there's also redemption and new creation. You, you saw this earlier this year. There was a gentleman by the name of Mark Dickey who, who was a specialist at, 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 at mining caves. As a matter of fact, it was just last month that he was in Turkey where, while he was on an expedition to help map out a cave there that 4,000 feet beneath the surface, he got stuck. Mark, Mark, Mark Dickey, not only did he get stuck, but he, was, he, he had a, a health care emergency 
while he was beneath the ground where it was only like 39 degrees Fahrenheit. He was there trapped and could not get out, and so they had to organize a rescue effort to be able to figure out how they could rescue him from this deep, dark cave. He couldn't get himself out. He couldn't rescue himself. He was totally dependent upon the rescue workers who would be willing to go down deep, deep beneath the earth to be able to get him and bring him back to surface. He, he couldn't rescue himself. He needed someone to rescue him. Friends, sin has put us in a deep, dark cave beneath the surface of the ground and just like Mark could not rescue himself guess what friend you and I can't rescue ourselves either it's easy to look at Adam and Eve and say listen I, I can't believe they did that I, I can't believe they made that choice and we are still dealing with the consequences to the day but can I tell you something if you took out Adam and Eve and put your name in the same spot you do the same thing you you want to act like you so strong and got everything together listen all we got to do is look at your last 24 hours and see the thoughts that you had and the ways that you had and the places you've been and you would be right where they were I was trying to prepare this sermon trying to put everything together and I was thinking about Adam and Eve and the Lord God said to me Brian that's you fool that's you in the text that's that's what you do that's that's how you act that's how you treat things and I said yes Lord you are right I'm all over chapter 3 and guess what so are you you're all over chapter 3 but I'm so glad it don't end with that verse I'm so glad that you have to keep reading it's in verse 20. I want you to see grace as it's seen in the text. It's in this last section. First of all, there's grace in the name. If you look at verse 20, it says, And Adam named his wife Eve. Her name means life giver. Here it is. God has told them because of sin, you're going to die. That's what happens in verse 19. But then Adam has the faith to call Eve Eve, life, even though one day they're going to die. He says, God, I know we've done wrong. God, I, I know we messed up, but I'm going to call her Eve because you said through her seed, her future will come. And so God, despite the brokenness, I'm by faith going to call her Eve because I still believe God through you. We can have life through your promises and through what you said. Somebody in the room knows what I'm talking about. You've been in a situation every now and then where they said it's dead they said it's done they said it'll never happen they said I don't see in the future they said you wouldn't bounce back but you had to call your situation Eve and say God even though it's dark even though I messed up even though I missed the mark thank you God that you can bring life even out of dead things There's grace in the name. There's also grace in the clothes. Look at verse 21. It says, and, and verse 20, and it says, and God, he, he, verse 21, and the Lord God made garments of skin for Adam and his wife and clothed them. They tried to deal with sin their own way. They made some fig leaves, and they tried to make some clothes to cover them. But what they didn't understand, that you can't just wash sin away. You can't just, just, you can't just play with sin and think it's going to go away. No, no, no. When you sin against the holy God, some blood has to be involved. Something has to die. The wages of sin is death. So God sacrificed some animals, put some clothes together and sold them some outfits to cover them and give them back their dignity and glory. When those Israelites had been escaped and they read about Genesis, they couldn't help but to remember and think of what God was doing for them every time they sacrificed an animal and had a priest do it for them. For Adam and Eve, they didn't have a priest. God was the priest. He laid out the animals and cover them. Oh, there's grace in the clothes. There's also grace in death. God says to them, you will die. 
We don't want you to touch the tree of life because you'll live forever in a sinful state. So both out of judgment and grace, he says you're going to die because I don't want you to stay there forever. I'm going to give you grace and I'm going to judge you and let you die so you don't stay in that case the whole time. There's grace in death. And here's the last one. There's grace in a promise. Verse 15, he will crush your head and you will strike his heel. Verse Genesis 3 and 15, that's called the proto Gilliam. It's the first mention of the gospel in the entire Bible. I want you to pay attention here, friend. He will crush your head but you will strike his heel. Remember I told you a war between good and evil. The seed of Satan and the seed of man he says, I want you to know the seed is going to come. It's going to come, and the seed will crush your head, serpent. Serpent, you got some victories today. Serpent, go and use cancer if you want to. Serpent, keep dividing us if you want to. Serpent, keep using racism and discrimination if you want to. Satan, keep on making us feel insecure, inadequate, and unable. Keep on doing it. There's a seed coming on the other side. You, you, you may have had some victory with Adam. There's a, there's a seed coming on the other side. Adam went to Abel, and Abel went to Seth, and Seth went to Noah, and Noah eventually to Abraham, and Abraham to Isaac, and to Isaac to Jacob, and to Jacob and to Judah, and to Judah, and eventually Boaz, and from Boaz to Obed, and to Obed to Jesse, and to Jesse, and to David, and to David eventually Joseph, and to Joseph, Jesus. Oh! There's a seed coming. He's on the way. Have him time. You might bruise his heel, but he's going to crush your head. He might bruise his heel, but he's going to crush your head. When they put him through a fixed trial, he was bruising his heel. When he marched down the Via Rodella Rosa, he was bruising his heel. When they hung him high and they stretched him wide, he was bruising his heel. Yeah. Yes, when they put a crown of thorns on his head, he was bruising his heel. When he hung his head and he died, he was bruising his heel. All night Friday, bruising his heel. All day Saturday, bruising his heel. All night Saturday, bruising his heel. But early Sunday morning, he crushed his head. All power in heaven and earth belongs to me. Oh, grave, where is your victory? Oh, death, where is your sting? Hallelujah, hallelujah. He will crush his head, bless his name. Yes. Yes. Yes! Hallelujah! 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 If you keep on reading over to Revelation chapter 20, you'll find that's the end of Satan. He may mess with you every now and then. He may try to disrupt God's plan, but that's only because he knows his time is limited. You keep on serving Jesus. You keep on lifting up his name. You keep on doing the best you can with what you've got. You keep on trusting God's will and plan for your life. And know this, you don't fight for victory, you fight from victory. You've already won. God's already did it. God's already opened the door. God's already made a way. God's already worked it out. God's already answered your prayer. God
God's already given the territory. God's already healed your body. God is already doing it. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Somebody thank God for Jesus in the room. Somebody thank God. Come on, I said somebody thank God. Somebody thank God for Jesus. Come on, somebody thank God that you got a Jesus that went down in the cave and pulled you up. Somebody thank God for Jesus. Thank you for saving your soul. Thank you for forgiving you. Thank you for keeping you. Thank you for showing you. Somebody thank God for Jesus in this place. Hallelujah.